Monsters exist, and only children can see them in a select group of hunters. Erica Slaughter came to this town to try and stop the creatures that she had discovered, but what she discovered was something much worse than one single monster eating the children. She discovered a brood of them. Now that she has been in this town, various children and various adults have been affected by the events happening, and it's time for her to try and figure out what is going on in Something is Killing the Children, Volume 2. This is Comic Story, and I take comic books, I turn them into audio dramas, I give you a link to the original book, and if you enjoy it, you're free to go add it to your collection. And this is Something Killing the Children, a book that we did Volume 1 of a couple of years ago, and I'll link Volume 1 down below. It shows your initial arrival to the town and all of the events kicking off. But don't worry, if you haven't seen that one, all you really need to know is that Erica Slaughter is a part of a group of hunters, and all of the rest of it gets explained right here. Also, just for fun, if you enjoy horror stories and you enjoy creative writing, click the link down below. I've launched a fun channel on the side where me and my brother get to write fun horror stories in a horror town that we created. It's just a simple thing if you enjoy my narrations and audio dramas. Now, let's get into Something is Killing the Children, Volume 2. The four friends went outside, joking and having shoved each other into the darkness, laughing about their sleepover. But as they push, deeper into the woods with the sole goal of making sure one of their friends goes through this dare, something shifts in the dark. Guys, did you see that? Noah gasps at his friend. As something larger and black shifts through the darkness of the forest, James moves towards his friend, but slips on some wet leaves and tumbles onto the ground. He staggers to his feet, putting out a thumbs up to show the others that he is okay and screams echo through the forest as he looks around in fear. Guys, where are you? Where, where, I, I can't. James mumbles from his hospital bed, still healing from the gunshot wound that put him there. Erica watches him from the doorway, but she turns when someone comes up behind her. He looks kind of peaceful, Tommy points out. No, he doesn't, she says as she glares at him, telling Tommy that James isn't going to die before looking at his head wound. They stitched you up, she observes, asking if anything was broken. And Tommy shakes his head. I should have hit you harder then, she says softly, and begins to move down the hallway with Tommy asking her to explain what happened in the cave, what that monster was. She refuses and he reaches out for her, grabbing her arm. She whirls around, gripping that arm, breaking it with one blow. Shit, did you just break my arm? Tommy asks with a scream of pain. And she reminds him that he doesn't want anything to do with this. Wait, this isn't over? Tommy shouts after her, but Erica is already gone. Elsewhere, the police have finally blocked off the woods, with the two detectives finding the pile of mutilated corpses of children that the monster was feeding on. We're going to need to spend the next few days identifying the bodies of these kids and informing the parents. The police chief says, trying to rub the exhaustion from his eyes with his older brother Tim noting that they've commandeered the school gym to store the bodies. The chief nods, heading out of the cave, where he finds a deputy John waiting for him. Demanding answers, the chief waves him off, telling him that they are ordered to keep the story quiet. That's it? Not supposed to let the story spread? Who got to you? How did they get to you? John demands, but the chief waves him off, ordering him to go home and deal with his concussion. Meanwhile, at the police station, Erica pushes open the door, finding Bian playing with crayons and paper on the floor while the secretary watches her. Do you know each other? Gail asks as she looks at the mysterious blonde woman. She was in the cave with me. She fought the monster. Bian says with a smile, and Erica stoops down, talking to Bian as she draws. What are you drawing? She asks, and Bian looks up at her with a serious look on her face. The babies? She says, showing Erica the drawing of five more dark monsters. Ah, <sighs> that's a lot of babies, Erica sighs. Meanwhile, over in Chicago, a strange dark house. Inside, Aaron sits quietly in a chair, waiting for word. The door behind him creaks open, and a woman comes out beckoning him to stand and follow her. They move through the lavished mansion as she explains that he will be heading north. He's angry, Aaron. Angry that you've kept her on this loose leash, she tells him. And he looks at her for a moment. He remembers how well she follows orders then, right? He sighs as they continue to walk. Do I get a driver at least? He asks, but she shakes her head, telling him that he will relieve Erica of her duties and finish the job. And what about the young man, Tommy Mahoney? He asks, and she looks at him for a moment before turning to see a portrait 
of a young Erica. He dies, of course. The House of Slaughter has learned its lesson about picking up strays. Mrs. Mahoney takes a drag from her cigarette as she stands in a crowd of parents, still dressed in her bathrobe from home. They all watch as the police pull black bags filled with the bodies of their missing children from the van, and they move them into the school gym. Tommy joins her, asking her to never come home with him, to try and rest and eat something. I'm not going anywhere until I say goodbye to my little girl, she tells him. Inside, the principal looks in shock at the number of bodies, and he turns to Tim, asking if they have any information about what did this, anything that he can tell the parents that have been gathering outside. I'm not the one to ask, Tim tells him. In the woods, Erica crouches in the trees, her large blade in her hand, preparing to strike. This won't work, the voice says from Octo, where he watches from her back. You know this won't work, he repeats. Something moves below them and Erica turns her gaze, staring down at the five baby creatures as they move through the woods, searching for food. The creatures shuffling about, making strange noises. What are they doing? She whispers. They're crying. They're crying because you killed their mother and they're hungry, Octo tells her. But it doesn't matter to Erica. She leaps from the tree, landing in a crouch, and the babies turn to her, hissing in anger and in fear. But Erica dashes towards them, swinging her blade. But it passes through them and the babies fade from her view. She stares in anger for a moment before a voice interrupts her thoughts. I want you to tell me why that didn't work. Aaron says as he steps out of the trees. She turns, glaring at him. Tell me, what is an Obscura type? He asks as she pulls down her mask, asking if the house sent him to quiz her. She quickly scales back up the tree, grabbing her bag and pulling on her coat, stalking away. I am your superior in the house, Aaron reminds her as he follows, but she whirls on him. Oh, shut up! You're a spoiled brat who reads all the right little books and knows all the theories, but you don't like getting your hands dirty. She snaps and I'm pointing out that he needs her to kill the creatures. And you know why you can't in their current phase? He says, pointing a finger at her, and she growls in frustration. Yeah, Oscura types are shadow forms, concentrated fear. They're only solid when they eat, she snaps, and he points his cane at her, questioning why she would bother to hunt the beast then. Because there are dead children, Aaron, and I don't want to wait until the next one dies before I do something about it. She shouts at him, and he pauses for a moment before lowering his mask. I'm, I'm sorry, I know this breed is more personal. He says, finally shaking his head and taking control of the situation by asking for the creature's hunting radius. You know we'll need bait. Where's the girl? He asks, but Erica refuses to use Bean to attract the monsters. But Aaron reminds her that bait is the only way to kill the creatures before they kill again. Did it touch the boy in the hospital? Would you rather use him? Both would be better than the two apart. We can draw them in, he concludes, and Erica looks at him pointing out that that will expose the two to order rituals. Stop making me look like a villain. We're not heroes, we're hunters. Don't forget that, Aaron reminds her. And with that, the two of them head off into the woods, unaware that John is watching them from the bushes. He picks up his phone, quickly dialing Gail at the station, telling the woman to pack B in a bag. He'll be by there soon to pick her up. At the hospital, James tries to sit up, groaning at the pain from his wound. Guess you haven't been shot before, huh? The sheriff says from the nearby chair, and James puts on his glasses, asking if the sheriff is here to arrest him. But the man shakes his head. They're coming at me from all sides, but nobody is telling me a thing that makes any sense, he says. And he finally stands, telling James that he needs him to give it to him straight, that he can handle it. James, I need you to tell me about these aliens, he says as he pulls on his hat. But James finally tells him that they're not aliens. They're monsters, like big shadow things that eat kids, he explains. And the sheriff takes it in stride, nodding his head and asking if he knows anything about Erica and the people that she works for. No, not really. I don't think she likes them very much either. James says, quickly telling him about what happened in the cave between him and Tommy Mahoney. You could see them too, the sheriff asks. I think so, James tells him. After everything, the sheriff finally walks out of the hospital room. And at the police station, Erica and Aaron come through the door, finding Bean still coloring on the floor. Hey, Bean, we're gonna go for a little drive now, Erica tells her. Bean agrees, standing up and gathering all of the paper and the markers. 
How about this? You take all the markers you want, kid. You just need to come with me, Deputy says, aiming his pistol at the two hunters. Everyone seems confused with Erica edging towards John. I don't think you know what you're doing, she says, and Gail reaches for the phone explaining that she needs to call the sheriff. But Aaron lashes out, cracking her across the skull with his cane. Jesus, Aaron! Erica shouts, and Bian begins to shout, wanting to know why Aaron just hurt Gail. I hurt her because everyone in your little town is very stupid, and apparently they want their children to keep being eaten. He shouts at her. Erica whirls back on John, demanding to know what he wants. And he looks at her over the sights of his pistol, explaining that he heard all about their plan to use Bian as bait. He motions for her to come to him, explaining that Erica and Aaron were planning on using her so that they could hunt the babies. You're gonna hurt the babies? They don't know good from bad, Bian shouts at Erica, and Aaron finally sighs in frustration. Oh, for the love of... He hisses as he begins to move forward, but Erica lashes out, cracking him across the head, bringing him down. She finally turns to John, asking him to keep Bian safe, to keep her away from the woods and the school. You're letting us go? He asks in shock, lowering his weapon, and she nods. You're being an idiot, but you're being an idiot for the right reasons. If you want to keep her safe, keep her safe. She says, motioning for them to go, and she turns back to the unconscious Aaron on the ground. Shit, she whispers. Over at the school, the crowd's parents have now become angry, with the police finally getting everyone calmed down as the principal steps forward, beginning to read the list of names. The night has begun to fall by the time that Aaron returns to the world of the living. Why did you hit me? He gasps as he sits up, wiping dried blood from his mouth, and he looks over at Erica, who is making Gail comfortable. Erica explains that she didn't want Bian getting hurt. Do you even know how to fight a human? She asks with a smirk. She points at Gail, telling Aaron that he needs to deal with the sheriff not arresting him. I'll get your bait, she says as she heads towards the exit. Better make it quick, Erica! It only takes one kill to make them deadlier. Aaron calls out after her. Meanwhile, Tommy has walked away from the crowd of parents, having heard something strange in the woods. The darkness seeming to swallow him whole as he moves, but his eyes widen in shock as he sees a splatter of blood on the ground. He looks up to see another dead kid, its organs spilled out around its body, and Tommy screams in fear as the babies appear out of the woods around him. Nearby, two brothers, Corey and Brandon, are wandering away from the school parking lot. They're looking for their little brother that took off into the woods, and they suddenly stop as the oldest looks at the ground. Is that blood? Corey asks, his brother looking up. There's something in the bushes, he says softly, and Tommy suddenly bursts out of the bushes, breathing hard as he shouts for the kids to run. Corey points to something behind Tommy, but the darkness moves from the trees, stabbing him through the chest. Brandon is frozen with fear and shock as the creatures close in around them. Tommy grabs him, trying to protect him. And meanwhile, at the hospital, James finally comes awake to find Erica standing by his doorway. He doesn't want to look at her. He knows why she is there. He knows that she isn't just there to check up on him. She stares at him for a moment before nodding. I need to use you as bait to lure monsters into a trap so that I can kill them. She explains simply. James finally sits up looking at her, angry at her for coming into his life. That she isn't some superhero like he thought she was. You're not in control. You don't know what you're doing. He says with a spit, but she shakes her head. I kind of know what I'm doing. And I know how bad it can get. And I know what kind of monster that is. And I know how fast this is going to grow and spread. And how many more kids are going to die. She tells him a story about a little wide-eyed girl who watched her best friend get ripped open and eaten. It grew strong enough that it managed to kill my mom and dad. They didn't understand what was happening. They were so helpless, but I could see it and I had to do something. She describes how young Erica found the kitchen knife and stabbed the monster until she was covered with blood. It was already half dead when a woman showed up wearing a mask like mine. She helped me capture it and cage it in my favorite stuffed animal. And then she offered to train me at the House of Slaughter to be a monster hunter in the Order of St. George. Just like her, she tells him. But she closes her eyes, telling him that while she thought she was joining something good, she soon discovered that the Order does more than keep the existence of monsters quiet than it does to actually stop them. When this all started, you asked me if I could help, and I said yes so that I could get the information that I needed to do my job. But now there's a thing that I do need your help with. And it's dangerous, and it might kill you, and it might kill me, 
But if we do it right, we can save a lot of kids' lives. But the whole conversation is interrupted as someone comes running into the room, a friend of Tommy's, who explains that he just called and thinks that the monsters might have gotten another kid. Shit! Erica hisses. In the woods, Corey is screaming for help as the monsters are closing in, but Tommy tells him to be quiet and get behind him. If I can distract them, Tommy says as he reaches for a rock, but one of the monsters lunges forward with Tommy smacking it across the face. Corey tries to run, but Tommy shouts for him to stop. And at that moment, one of the monster's claws tears through the young boy's chest. Tommy yells at the monster, throwing his rock, and they release Corey, allowing his body to fall to the ground. Tommy kneels by him, apologizing for letting him die. No one else is dying, Tommy, but I'm going to need you to put your hands on top of your head. The sheriff calls out as Tommy looks up to see several cops with their pistols pointed at him and two dead bodies nearby. The sheriff turns to his two deputies, telling them to clear everyone from the school parking lot, that he doesn't want anyone to do anything stupid. I didn't want this, Tommy tells him, and the sheriff looks at him. Son, you've watched the movies before. The right is to remain silent. The sheriff reminds him, but Tommy won't be quiet. But I didn't do this, and they're still out there. They could be back any minute, he says, and the sheriff tells him to be quiet again. And Tommy realizes that he knows something. I don't know anything. The sheriff tells him softly. That's encouraging to hear, Aaron says as he steps out of the woods. Sheriff Cavanaugh, I presume? We spoke over the phone, Aaron says to him. Of course we did, Cavanaugh snaps. Aaron nods, telling him that his men will need their sheriff's authority to keep the parents in line, but he will make sure that Tommy doesn't get into any trouble and wander off. The sheriff starts to argue, but finally relents, leaving the two of them alone in the woods. And Tommy looks up at Aaron, aware that he is from the same group as Erica, telling him that she did something that allows him to see the monsters. I'm well aware of what Erica did to you, boy, Aaron says, pulling the head of his cane off, revealing a syringe. Tommy begins to back away as the man steps forward, pulling on his mask. You have neither the wherewithal or the training to be anything but a nuisance to the Order of St. George. I cannot allow you to live, he says simply. While meanwhile... Erica and James have arrived at the school, pushing through the angry parents who are now being told to leave and they haven't seen their kids yet. She pushes up to the sheriff. I've had enough to hear with you people, he sighs, but she ignores the comment. I need you to tell me what the hell is going on, she says, and the sheriff holds up three fingers, telling her how he found Tommy Mahoney with the three new bodies and how Aaron was in the woods watching him. Three bodies and there are children here. Okay. She says eyes wide, and she looks at the crowd telling Kavanaugh that he needs to have his officers get the families with children as far away as possible. And she turns back to James. James, I need you to listen to me. The situation is much more dangerous than anyone realizes, yet I won't let you get hurt, she tells him. And she looks back to the sheriff, telling him that someone needs to take James nearby. Kavanaugh motions to his brother, asking him to take James inside of the gym. With that, Erica and the sheriff head into the woods. Meanwhile, Tommy is dizzy and weak from the shot that Aaron gave him, swaying as he asks what is going on. The world is a dark place, Mr. Mahoney. A very dark place. Aaron says as he pulls out a large knife. If people really understood, I don't think anyone would ever sleep again, knowing that their fears are coming to life and feeding on their young. The order does not allow independent agents. It is crucial that the big secrets don't get into the wrong hands. He says as he leans forward with the knife, but Erica is there grabbing the blade, slamming Aaron into the ground. This is why you were sent here, isn't it? It's all about the cover-up. She shouts at Aaron, reminding him that the creatures are nearby and the parking lot is full of children. He helps Tommy to his feet, asking Kavanaugh to bring him back to the school. Aaron pushes her away, managing to stand. I was trying to make this painless, but I can go the other way instead. He snaps, and Erica grabs him, slamming him into a tree, angry at him, but explaining that she needs his help. Five Oscura types, three dead. Think for a second, she hisses at him, and Aaron stares at her for a moment before she releases him. He straightens his tie. That's not enough for a full brood. They'll have grown with each kill. Three bodies are enough to fill one, not five, he says quietly, and she nods her head, pointing out that they could have killed the creatures if he wasn't acting as the Order's lapdog. You've made your point. No reason to be rude. This is what none of you understand. While you're following the rules, real people are getting hurt, she tells him as she heads back towards the school. In the parking lot, a little girl is moving through the crowd, playing with a toy. 
And as she reaches the edge, she and the other kids look up, and tears begin to well in their eyes. The monster looks down at them, blood dripping from its body. Kavanaugh and Tommy reach the edge of the woods, with the young man's eyes going wide. Get that little girl right now! Tommy gasps, trying to rush forward, but he trips and falls on the edge of the parking lot. Everyone watches as the little girl is lifted into the air, seemingly by nothing as none of them can see it. She screams in pain before her body is ripped in half. Tommy's mother is moving forward, but she rushes to push her aside, barely avoiding another swipe of the monster's claws. Everyone begins to run towards the gym in the chaos, and Erica and Aaron reach the edge of the woods, their eyes widening as they watch the monster's attack. You brought the boy? Aaron asks, and Erica nods as he tells her that he needs her to get him as far away as possible. Get the girl as well. You'll be able to draw them into a trap. He says, drawing his blade, reminding her of what the Order will do now that this many have seen an attack. Now let me get to work. He says as he stalks forward, with Erica rushing to the civilians, ordering and pushing them all inside. He's gonna fight them? Tommy asks, still groggy. But Erica shakes her head. That's not what this is, Tommy. Aaron rushes forward, lashing out with the knives, drawing first blood, but the creatures whirl and a claw goes through Aaron's arm, severing it. In seconds, they have descended upon him devouring him. Not this soon! He gasps as he disappears under the bodies. And that cliffhanger is where Something is Killing the Children Volume 2 comes to its conclusion. Now if you want me to bring this back and have it lumped into the Radiant Black, the Berserker, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers rotation, give this video a like. Let me know in the comments down below what you like about this story and hit subscribe on this channel. If we see enough engagement on this video, we'll come back with Volume 3 and we'll see where this ends. Or you can go buy it yourself at your local comic book store. If you want to get early access to all of our videos, make sure you hit us up on Patreon or go to our YouTube memberships. And at the end of the day, guys, don't forget to check out our other channel that I mentioned, where we're just having fun writing short stories, short horror stories. It's known as Tales from the Mind, and you can find the link to it down below. Thank you.